Let's just give them a Ahmad, I didn't want to forget mentioning um, Ahmad Amar sent his regards. Yes, uh, I saw him uh, in, uh, yes. uh, uh, yesterday in the uh, Cairo meeting. Mediterranean, yes, yes, the Mediterranean Association meeting. Yeah, he, he, he knows me. you well, and he, and he, he contacted me. <laughs> yes, uh, we have we have huge respect and love for 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 both of you, but for all of you, uh, Ahmad is. Uh, Another amazing soul. Wonderful. Let's just give them another minute or oh, 30 seconds for the uh, others to join a bit. Um, and of course, it's being broadcast, as I said, on other channels and other places and uh, recorded for, for trainees and posterity. So thank you again. So... Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Um, welcome, everybody. It's my pleasure um, to welcome you to our fourth webinar on the field of neuroendoscopy. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome the panel. Um, Professor Henry Schroeder will be joining us after a, a little uh, delay, um, and we will welcome him when he does. And it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Ahmad Zohdi, from Cairo in Egypt, one of the giants in this field of neuroendoscopy for CSF disorders. And um, it's wonderful that he's here to, to start things off for us. And of course, uh, our wonderful uh, Mr. Basil Zabian, consultant neurosurgeon from King's College Hospital in London, who is uh, uh, a wonderful star and, and rising talent in this field, which uh, has already uh, taught me quite a, quite a lot from, from the presentations and from the experiences. So welcome to everybody. Um, we've already done um, three other webinars. So this is a fourth one. And the title is um, Neuroendoscopy for Intraventricular Lesions. We were thinking of calling it tumors, but there's obviously there's more than that. So and we've had a very good reception and uh, great experiences shared on neuroendoscopy for CSF pathway lesions, for ETV and tips and pearls, for colloid cysts, and now for intraventricular lesions. Um, it's a, a huge field, lots to discuss, and uh, please do join us for more webinars to come. Um, we've got some excellent stuff happening regarding another update on the new classification of hydrocephalus in January on the 8th, 19th, uh, on our webinar, on the 25th with Professor Jürgen Beck uh, on updates regarding uh, spontaneous intrafrenal hypo hypotension, and um, Professor Madoka from Japan will be joining us on the 8th of March to talk to us about lumbar peritoneal shunts for NPH uh, with Giorgio Palandri from Italy. And, um, and we're going to have a wonderful webinar on the 15th of March with Professor Hakim's um, uh, group. In fact, uh, his two sons will be honoring us to discuss their father's legacy and a summation of management of NPH uh, and discussing the beginnings of Hakim's triad. So that should be wonderful. And of course, in April, um, Professor Lalani and Basil joining us to discuss the neuroradiological uh, findings and aspects of, um, in particular, spontaneous intracranial hypotension and CSF disorders uh, overall. So, pleasure to welcome you all. Um, Professor Ahmad, would you like to start for us? Thank you so yes. much. Hello, everybody. Well, today's um, topic is the are the interventricular lesions. Uh, I added to the title Concepts and Prospects to pave the way both for Henry and Basil to, 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 to give their part and contribution. Uh, this is where I come from. I come from Cairo, Cairo University. Uh, Ahmad, the, the, could, you, could you share the screen? My apologies. Thank you. Sorry. To I did share. It is shared. Um, the screen is shared. I'm sorry. We're not able to see. Maybe... No, we can't see. Uh, can you try again, Ahmed? Yes, I have to try again. Thank you. It's again jammed. I don't know why, but I manage. Yes, I'm sure it'll be fine. Not to escape. Well, this is very strange. No problem, Ahmed. Yes, we have. We have. Um, 
I know, but uh, 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 it's it's jammed, so I don't know what to do now. Escape? It's not escaping. It's not going forwards or backwards. Uh huh. That's Take your good. time. Let's give it a minute or so. You're, you're not still you still don't. It's uh, no. We still can't see it. I'll let you know when we do. No, no worries. And if it's difficult, we may. Uh, we, may be able to start off with, with Basil's presentation if he's available. But let's just try for another minute or two. Thank you. I'll share the screen another time. It is, seems to be yes. working. Yes, that's working now. Wonderful. Just the slideshow now. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, and just uh, the slideshow. Excellent. Is it okay? Fantastic. Excellent. Yes, we Thank see it very well. I, I go back again and tell you just where I come from. This is the Cairo, the Faculty of Medicine at Qasr al -Aini School of Medicine. It's about, we're going to celebrate in five years, uh, 150 years. Uh, these are the old buildings with the dome, the dome over the uh, uh, Dean's office, built in 1932. These are the new buildings, 1995. The uh, capacity of our hospitals are more than 5,000 beds. Okay, now to the core of our subject, the current intraventricular neuroendoscopic procedures. This is a versatile technique. And these are uh, the procedures that have uh, uh, proven to be throughout the time, the ben most beneficial uh, way of handling intraventricular lesions whether fenestration, ETB, cysts, uh, the septa, septostomies, restoration for aminoplasty, ecodactyloplasty, excision and biopsy or excision and biopsy, and last but not least, endoscopic shunt procedures, procedures. Our prime purpose in this life is to help others. And if you can't help them, please don't hurt them. Neuroendoscopy has a, a really steep learning curve. Uh, and you have to have a, a definite uh, command of the morbid anatomy. Endoscopic anatomy of the cerebral ventricles is a morbid anatomy, mixture of displayed, outstretched, dysplastic abnormalities through a tedious learning curve. You get to manage and to transfer the actual 2D underwater to 4D. It's the motion parallax, it's the, uh, the shades, the illumination, illumination, the zoom in and zoom out. And even you reach up to a fifth D is achieved by the chronicity of the disease and knowing what happens and what are the uh, aftermath and the sequelae and the uh, sequential uh, anatomy, as we call it, as the disease progresses and the degree of hydrocephalus becomes more and more chronic and it enlarges. The visual range of your lens mandates a good anatomical uh, knowledge and experience because you are seeing just in front of the lens. So take care. Expertise, armamentarium, and methodology are ongoing and will optimize your understanding to this kind of extremely variable surgical anatomy. The better we see, the more we know, the more we know, the more we see. These are just examples of what you see when you go in there of variant anatomical changes that happen with hydrocephalic changes. Endoscop endoscopy in intraventricular regions mandates a tedious learning curve, as I've been stressing all through, in command of morbid anatomy. And now your concern mainly are the tools. Bipolar forceps, you don't have a bipolar forceps. Endoscopic ultrasonic aspirator probe, this is advantageous. A holding system is in lengthy surgeries and procedures a must. Now the port of technique, you might even work through a, a, a cylindrical transparent conduit, or uh, you'll have to deal with the straight trajectory and the bimanual trial of bimanual dissection. And, and, and this goes with the transparent conduit and the hemostasis, which is another problem because a minor bleed might obstruct your vision totally. So profuse irrigation, balloon pressure, small chamber irrigation technique and dry field technique are your choices. 
Now, the selection is another important thing. The size is preferably in and around two centimeters. Uh, hydrocephalus should be there. And uh, the consistency of the mass that you're dealing with would be preferably soft. And if solid, better avascular. Now, these are the most important structures that you deal with or, or uh, uh, as you go in to your target area, which is the most commonly done uh, issue, the ETD. But I, I mean, I have to mention that uh, because the foramen of Monroe is your port to any third ventricular tumors. And the floor of the third ventricle is your port for an ETV. If you want to do an ETV after you've done your surgery, in case, in case you need to make sure that the CSF is properly diverted. And of course, the port of exit are the Lilliquist membranes. And we are going to talk more about them as we mentioned the intracranial arachnoid cysts or the supracellular ones. Very important are the potential midline cavities because they could be your corridor uh, when you want to reach an intraventricular lesion. There are three main uh, midline cavities, the cavium septum pellucidum, which is the fifth ventricle, and which you see here, solely cavium septum pellucidum, the cavium septum virgin, sixth ventricle, and here you see it, and this is very uncommon. I, I, I looked for it for years to find such a solely cavum septum uh, virgin. And here is it's both uh, septi are, are, are cavum uh, or are caved. Uh, and last but not least is the velum interpositum and the cavum velum interpositum. And this is a diagram to show you how they are related to each other. You have to understand their, where they are and accordingly you are going to deal with them as you want to target one of your uh, lesions inside the ventricle. We recently published this paper, which is again very interesting because it gives you some guidelines. It is not this area which is the most difficult and the most hazardous area and trajectory into the third ventricle through the foramen of Monroe with the choroid plexus terrifying everybody. You can coagulate it safely. And this is the most safe entry zone. Next to it is this entry zone, uh, next to the thalamus, but you have to take care about the thalamus the right vein not to injure it. Least safe is, uh, or less safe uh, is the C area with the fornix, or the column of fornix, or the column of fornix on one side. And the most difficult part, and the one that you should always avoid is this part, because here the body, will be injured and you definitely have memory deficit. Very important are the standalone procedures versus endoscopic assisted, endoscopic controlled versus microsurgery. So you either do endoscopic inspection to A, to A, to, A, to, 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 so that it would add to your plan and you'd be able to do endoscopic assisted microsurgery when you know where your lesion stands and where the vascular supply comes from by the inspection. And then you might resort only to endoscopic surgery if it is an avascular lesion and you can deal with it. Or last but not least, it's the pendulum that can take you to the microsurgery. It is always in between the pendulum. It will take you right and left and the stare decisis and to, to stick to one to stick and stand by the decisions, I mean, you have to be malleable. The illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. So persevere, hope for the best, but be able to convert and plan for the worst because of the patient's safety. Now, the variables affecting strategy I strictly believe and my team that the keyhole for any intraventricular surgery, especially in and around the third ventricle, is the Kocherber hole. Because through this Kocherber hole, you can manage a lot of things. 
It, you can start by endoscopic surgery, turn into endoscopic assisted by manual. The port of entry and corridor is suggested by this cochlear hole when you do a, a, a sort of an investigation or, or you just go in to see what's happening. So you could extend anteriorly your mini craniotomy and still be minimal invasive or posteriorly, and you're still safe. And these are all one inch mini craniotomies. But the, after inspecting with the endoscope or such a craniotomy, and deal with the lesion accordingly. So it's a keyhole, an actual keyhole, as suggested by uh, Professor Yashagi. Radicality and safety are, again, an important issue uh, to, to, to have in mind. The minimal invasive concept and the tailored approach. Now, this is an example why and how, why we, we, we talk about this Kocher rule. As you go in, you see this kind of lesion by MRI, and then you see a sort, sort of ball and socket valve that is blocking the foramen of Monroe arising from the lateral wall of the lateral ventricle, pedicle, mass. And you, with the inspection that you do, you find out that it is not attached to the foramen of Monroe, but there is still a place that you can go or you can dissect the whole thing. As you can see, it's not attached. It's just blocking the foramen of Monroe. So we shifted to microsurgery. We shaved the tumor off the lateral ventricle. And then went again with the endoscope to, to discover, and this is another advantage of the endoscope, to discover that there is some kind of drop, uh, I won't say metastasis, a drop seeding, and there's an ulcer here. And it proved to be an astrocytoma grade two, and he needed adjuvant therapy. Okay, so this is a major advantage. Again, another advantage is to deal with such a mass or it is a cyst, actually, a velum interpositum cyst, or an insisted velum interpositum. Instead of going forwards, you go backwards. And you tackle the cyst, either in solely endoscopically, or if you need to, and if it is a tumor with the, with the, the solid part in it, you can, with this approach, you can reach it and you can remove the solid part. Interesting cases that I'm going to show to you is the, are the is a, this is a cavernoma in and around the foramen of Monroe, blocking the foramen of Monroe. And this is how you deal with it. You remove it solely endoscopically and you get this result and everything is solved. The reduction of the uh, hydrocephalic, the unilateral hydrocephalic changes. While in this kind of cavernoma, which is uh, which is blocking the aqueduct of Silvius, you use the endoscope only to do an ETV, and then um, you will do uh, uh, adjuvant. Uh, you you will uh, you will do the adjuvant therapy. I will use the adjuvant therapy to cure the case. Triventricular hydrocephalus, pioneer region tumors. You go in and do an ETV. You can take a biopsy by changing your telescope. Sometimes it's amenable, sometimes not. These are kind of ETVs that you do for fourth ventricular tumors. And sometimes you have drop metastasis and the area is blocked. So you can't do anything about it. 
These are also very interesting uh, cases with proximal intracystern hydrocephalus after fourth ventricular tumors, again related to the subject, intraventricular lesions that cause postoperatively such kind of uh, block, proximal intracisterna, and you can do an ETV. Another kind is this choroid cyst that you can cure endoscopically. Management of fourth ventricular tumors with hydrocephalus. This is after two large series and, and uh, sort of research that we've done. We, we, we follow this uh, algorithm or scheme, uh, external ventricular drain, tumor removal, ICP monitoring, ETV if needed, VP if ATV fails. Interestingly enough, there is the craniopharyngioma that you can remove. In, uh, it's an intraventricular lesion, and yet you remove it now through endo endonasally with the endoscope. So this is another kind of, uh, of lesion that you can deal with. And this is the pre and this is the post-operative, and you can do it. And this is intraventricular surgery, but through another port endonasally. Liliquist membrane, very important for the, uh, actually to, to, to know all about the Liliquist membrane and all the leaves of the Liliquist membrane because they might give you a clue how to do with the supracellular arachnoid cysts. This is, for example, and uh, these are the prepontine cysts and they caused uh, a supracellular arachnoid uh, cyst and, and uh, they are actually originating sausage-like and originating from the prepontine area. And you can see the interpeduncular cistern here, but it is moving up. And this is how it looks like endoscopically. This is another case with a prepontine uh, cyst and supracerebellar cyst and equiducted stenosis. You solve all this problem by just an ETV, but going through all the three layers, as I will explain here. If you go here, then this is what you'll see. You didn't do your job, you're outside. If you go through the diencephalic membrane, you're in the interpeduncular system, and this is what you see. You still have the mesencephalic uh, leaflet to cross into the, this is, what you should do, and this is how you reach your target, and you do as uh, an endoscopic ventriculo cystu cystal nostomy and solve the arach supracellular arachnoid cyst. Another uh, very, very frustrating uh, intraventricular lesions are the multilocular complex hydrocephalus patients. When I, I guess whatever you do to these patients, and even if you with all these procedures and the films there, and I'm going to just conclude here that to see, okay, we have an excellent uh, uh, MRI or CT, and and uh, as a matter of fact, this is a more higher cut, but the, the shunt is still there, and unfortunately, the child is is. A, is, is a complete failure. I mean, as regards the mental faculties, et cetera, et cetera. Radiologically, it's a perfect result, but yeah. And it's always a precious child and very frustrating more to the neurosurgeons than the, than the parents themselves. It's at the end of the day, a set of mind, the knowledge, the anatomical knowledge, a set of skills, the learning curve, the steep learning curve, and a set of tools, your endoscopic equipment and the total command of your anatomy and all the, 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 and the, and the scope of your tools, of what you can do and what you cannot do. Take home message, prepare yourself for a tedious learning curve, focus on command of morbid anatomy and anticipate anatomical variations, expect limitations, do's and don'ts, doable or not. 
convey and share the valuable knowledge, patient safety comes first. We have to agree on that. Plan your surgery and hope for the best. Thank you very much. Um, excellent. Thank you, Professor Zuhri. Thank you. Um, really marvelous to set the scene with that. Um, before I maybe ask some questions, I wanted to welcome Professor Henry Schroeder. Uh, it's lovely for him to, to join uh, the whole panel. And once again, it's our honor to have him here and to praise his uh, services. I've heard that he's just been teaching and examining medical students. And now he's going to go from one generation all the way to the other and teach <laughs> those who are uh, decades further in their career and share experiences. So thank you very much again, uh, Henry. Thank you. Um, My pleasure. I, would, thank you. I wanted to encourage the participants and the friends to put their questions in the Q&A section. Um, uh, if, if, if that's all right. Um, and the first question, and this is to put to all the panel, if, if you don't mind, maybe starting with, with Ahmad, if that's okay. Um, a question that's been put, which I was actually, actually going to ask, is about the use of neuronavigation within neuroendoscopy. If you could comment on maybe all three, one after the other, beginning with Ahmad, if you use neuronavigation, and um, which cases you use it on. Perhaps if you could comment also on throwing the positioning of the head, do you fix the head, what new navigation do you use and so on, please. Thank you. Uh, I, I usually don't use the neural navigation in uh, endoscopic procedures that are done transcranially, maybe endonasal, uh, like with the craniopharyngioma that I've shown, I might use to, to make sure that the corridor and the trajectory are safe. But other than that, I mean, this is the, the idea behind the ski bill hole uh, and the inspection that I do with the endoscope. This, I would, I, in my opinion, suffices and takes the role of uh, image guided surgery because it gives you an idea, an actual uh, idea about the a pedicle of the tumor, the uh, vascularity of the tumor, where it's originating from exactly, etc., 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 and the location would be also easier because you see it. Uh, I don't use an uh, image guidance uh, with for intraventricular surgery done through the uh, transcranial. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Uh, Henry, would you like to make any comments about neuronavigation for- Yeah, I, ha I have a different perspective. So we use neuronavigation quite frequently in endoscopy and we have a German course and some of my colleagues, they requested any procedure is done with navigation because in all departments, it sometimes happens that they do not hit the ventricle, but go a little bit more lateral, go to the head of the cord nucleus or even to the thalamus. And this, this might happen if you're not careful. So I think in, if you have very wide ventricles and we make an ETV, I don't use it. I think uh, a new surgeon could be able to bring the endoscope in if you have wide ventricles and you have a standard coho borehole, you know, you go just right angle in all directions and hit the ventricle. But we do frequently endoscopy also in very narrow ventricles to get biopsies. And for these, of course, navigation is very, very helpful to find the ideal trajectory. Also for colloid cyst, I always use it to have the ideal approach to the cyst. So I come from far from uh, anteriorly and laterally. I just want to slide over the head curve of the colloid nucleus. I discussed it last time when we had the colloid cyst. So for me, neural navigation is very important to find the accurate approach. Also for, for example, interparenchymal cysts, you have no landmark to log in, you just see brain tissue. And then you want to make a fenestration to the ventricle and you have to find the thinnest part of the parenchyma to come to the lateral ventricle. Also for this, navigation is extremely helpful. So that's why I use neural navigation in these special cases, not for a standard ETV and large ventricles, but even what I told you, some people request do it because it's not much more effort. It takes five minutes to set up the navigation system and you have it in your department, why you should not use it, especially when younger doctors are doing it. But on the contrary, and Ahmed is right, you should not trust the navigation. You have always to check it. 
I'm just the expert witness in a lawsuit where a surgeon introduced an endoscope under navigation, obviously without checking anything, and went seven centimeters and destroyed the thalamus on one side. And this should not happen. Each of the endoscopes has land markings on the shaft and you know how deep you are. And when you introduce under navigation, and after let's say four, four centimeters, you don't hit the ventricle or you, although you measure that the cortical mantle is just three, something is wrong with the navigation. You cannot go just once anymore, more, more. That's not, not okay. So the, the, the drawback with the, endos, uh, with the navigation is you have always to check whether that what the new navigation is showing to you is really correct and plausible. Is it really, is it, or could it be okay? So you have to check the landmarks always. Before we use it, I always check the landmarks. Is it on all positions really on the, on the spot? Some, you know, sometimes somebody is hitting the, the dynamic reference frame and then it's completely out of order. This is completely wrong. And this should be recognized. You cannot say, oh, the navigation was not okay. It's not my fault that I'm ending up here in the wrong way. You have to check it always. And that is a problem with the navigation. You must always be very careful that that what the navigation screen is showing to you really fits to the real anatomy. And that is the thing what you should learn. You should not blindly trust it because this can be a disaster. So we use, you, we have the optical system from Brain Lab. We don't use the electric magnetic one. Some people say the electric magnetic is very good because you don't need anything in the optical axis. But there are also some problems with this uh, magnetic field navigation, in my opinion. So navigation, yes, it's very helpful, but you have to be very careful and you have to always to check, is it really the way to go or is it something wrong? You know, sometimes it shows completely wrong trajectories and you know it's not correct and then you have you should not use it. Thank you very much, Henry. Um, I think you've hit on some core issues. Um, I know of a particular case where someone was putting a scope in and they thought they were recording the operation, but in fact they were watching a pre-recorded operation and, yeah. and it wasn't so good. Um, and as you say, it's, it's good to get you to the target and know where you are, but once you know where you are, just look at what you're doing and what you need to do. Yes. Um, and it's reassuring medical legally for those particularly who are you know, starting out and, and trying to adhere to good principles to, to use it, but not to over rely on it. Um, Basil, would you like to make some comments on this from this excellent question from Maximilian? Thanks. Uh, yeah, no, it's absolutely, I couldn't agree more. It's an excellent question. I think the answers uh, we've already heard are, are absolutely spot on. I, it's good that we've got three of us and we all do things slightly differently because that's really what you want to see. Uh, and I do use navigation. I use it for everyone, but that's because uh, the uh, imaging that we do is um, uh, already, all, all the imaging that we do is already compatible with the uh, stealth station. Uh, so we do you know, T2 cubes, which are one millimeter scans, and I merge them with a cis sequence. Uh, so they're already ready. So the only cost is just the stilet. Everything else is basically uh, uh, is basically there. And it's electromagnetic that I use because I do a lot of pediatric, but I use it also when you're pinning. And a lot of the criticism of electromagnetic is that you can't use it when there's pins. I use it now. We're doing a brainstem tumor. I'm going down to give Christina a hand with that. We're doing it open, not endoscopic, but um, we're using the axiom uh, with with the uh, with prone and with pins, but you just have to position it in certain ways and suture the tracker. The reason I use it is because it actually helps the trainees and helps helps me develop the anatomy and the understanding of the anatomy better and the 3D anatomy. And I always make sure that they measure from certain landmarks, from the external auditory meatus or from whichever landmarks in certain planes to say, if you want to go in this trajectory, where would your burr hole be? And then they measure and then they go and check. They put the burr hole uh, where they would do the burr hole on the head. And then they check with the uh, with the with the axiom and they see if they've got it right or wrong. And normally, you know, within weeks, you see how they develop a better understanding of the anatomy. So I always use it. But yes, I don't always rely on it. And like um, Professor Schroeder said, I do sometimes go into very small ventricles. And these ones, there was one patient specifically where the axiom wasn't working and I took that risk and I went in and it was very tricky it, 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 I'm sure we ended up with more complications as a result of the fact that I was only a few millimeters off but a few millimeters off in in small ventricles is a, is a big nightmare sometimes thank you very much that's excellent summary um I'm 
really keen to ask more questions, but I'm going to control myself and wait for the rest of the presentations. One quick question from the panel, from the audience. Noor Saleh is asking, um, does using endoscopy provide a marked advantage to, to approaching skull-based tumors in comparison to endonasal approaches? When to use one over the other? I guess what he's referring to is when do you come from the top and when do you go from the bottom? Um, if, if maybe, Henry, do you have any... Any, anything to say about that? And maybe then Basil or, and, and, and Ahmad? It's this not an easy yeah, question. The, the answer is easy. It depends from the case. Of course, there are cases where the endonasal approach is much better. And then there are cases where the transcranial approach is much better. If you have a tumor which is lateral to the optic nerve, it's lateral to the carotid, of course, you make a transcranial approach. And then endoscopy is very helpful also in this surgery. So endoscopy is just a tool for visualization. So you can use it in transcranial approaches and endonasal. It doesn't matter. This has nothing to do with what is better and what is not. The approach is the difference. And the approach can be enhanced in any time with an endoscope. If you have a blind corner, want to look around the corner. Um, thank you. I mean, as you say, Henry, there's a big difference between dealing with a cystic cranial pharyngioma you just want to drain as opposed to you want to excise it from the bottom. Um, um, Basil, Ahmad, do you, any, any comments about that? Would you agree with, with that? Yeah, that Midline, yes. Other than that, no. <laughs> thank you. Wonderful. Right. Without further ado, if it's okay, I want to there once again welcome Henry. Um, to the panel and uh, we're, we're really keen to uh, hear the next part. So thank you very much, Henry. Please go ahead and um, share your experiences. We can't wait, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mansoor. Thanks for this kind of invitation and your initiative to promote endoscopy furthermore. I hope you can see my screen, is it correct? It's excellent, thank you. Yeah, so I want to talk about endoscopy in intraventricular tumors, so not cysts or so, they're just real um, interventricular tumors. And of course, what are the symptoms of intracranial tumors, uh, interventricular tumors usually or frequently, they cause a blockage of CSF pathways and you have hydrocephalus and headache. That is the symptomatology which many tumors cause and were found. Sometimes you have neurological symptoms, sometimes they present with seizures. So what are the treatment goals? Of course, we want to restore the CSF circulation. Previously, you know, a shunt was taken and then the biopsy was taken. Nowadays, with endoscopy, we can restore CSF circulation in many cases, and at the same surgery, we get a biopsy. And sometimes, if the tumor is not too large, we can even get a total tumor resection. So, all is depending on certain factors. So, what are the factors influencing the approach? Of course, the size of the ventricles is very important to make a differentiation, for example. Do you make a transcalosal approach? Do you make a transcortical approach? Tumor location is important, tumor size. And what is really of utmost importance is the vascularity of the tumor. If you have a high vascular tumor, then endoscopy can be a nightmare. And then I think it's better you switch to a dry field technique or to an open microsurgical technique. The individual, individual anatomy is important. Of course, the aim of the surgery and what is the best technique in the surgeon's hands? It's also very variable. So the equipment, what we use for intraventricular endoscopy for tumors is a lot of ventriculoscope. So we have two different sizes. The larger one has a, a working channel of 2.9 millimeters. So this is very effective in tumor resection. You can use a suction tube, a large one to resect. You have irrigation inflow and outflow. And we have a smaller one, what we use for biopsy or when we have small ventricles. That is also very important. Or when we make simple an ETV and the biopsy, usually we take a little lot of scope. <clears throat> what for me is very important is the use of these endoscopic sheaths. So initially the troca is put into the sheaths, then you puncture the ventricle or cyst wherever you want to go. And then you remove it and bring the endoscope in. And that is for me very important because I use this as a tool. So I use it as a retractor and I can use it to create an uh, additional space. So when the ventricles are very narrow, I go with the endoscope a little bit back. So and then I use the front, the tip of the endoscopic sheath as a room for dissection. So retraction of the sheath, you see this was a colloid cyst was here under the fornix, so I go with my endoscope into the sheath, so I have control over the tip. 
of my endoscopic sheath. And then I push your fornix a little bit away. And then I have the lesion in the middle of my surgical field. So this is very important to use the endoscopic sheath, in my opinion. This is underestimated. People say, oh, I take a, I don't like it. Or I want to have no sheath. Some take a peel away. But for me, this metal thing is a very important part of the surgical instruments. Hemostasis is, of course, very important if you deal with tumors. So we have a bipolar diathermy uh, forceps and we have a, a probe bipolar for irrigation. We have simply an, a tube which is connected to a syringe and then we irrigate. You can also use a machine for irrigation. It is volume and it is pressure regulated but it is used for knee surgery. So it can go very far up with the pressures. So you have to be very careful. It's an off-label use. We use it rarely, only if you have really um, a surgery where you have a lot of hemorrhage. Usually we take us just a syringe and rinse with ringer solution. And this is a bipolar, but it's very effective. We can coagulate the coral plexus or the tumor. Then is a technique what we call a small chamber irrigation technique for hemostasis. That is good. So if you have a hemorrhage, you don't see very well, you start to irrigate. And then if you have a glimpse of the anatomy, I go very close with the endoscope tip, with the uh, endoscopic sheath. And then I go back with my endoscope into the sheath to create here a small chamber. And this chamber can be easily cleared from bleeding. So you irrigate and then you have a clear view. And if you are close, with the tip of the endoscopic sheath, you have a good view and you can coagulate and get can get a good hemostasis. The another technique is a dry field technique. Dry field technique is used when you cannot clear the view with irrigation. So we simply remove the bloody CSF with a suction tube and have a dry field. We published this first in 2002 and uh, uh, Joachim Oertel has published six more cases. That's quite a useful technique to avoid that you convert to microsurgery if you have a major hemorrhage. What is our setup? We use this uh, pneumatic holding arm, it's Mitaka arm, which is very nice. It's called point setter and it's a, it's a Japanese company called Mitaka. That's very good because it's easy. You just press this golden button here and then you can really bring it in any position very conveniently. And then you release the button and it's fixed. Of course, it's a little bit subsidence at the tip, but in general, for me, at least up to now, it is the best, uh, the best equipment. The robotics arm, which are available, are very expensive and are too bulky, in my opinion. So I like this pneumatic arm very much. With the left hand, you guide the endoscope. You go left, right, in, out. And with the right hand, you just control the depths of your instruments. Frequently, you see... The, uh, our pupils at the courses, and they try to bend the, the forceps left and right to go there, but it's not possible because you are in this working channel. So you have to guide the endoscope left, right, in, out, just with the left hand and with the right hand, you control the depths of your instrument and you take a biopsy. <clears throat> so your navigation can be easily adapted to the LOTA system. We just fix here the reference frame to the endoscopic sheath, then you bring it to the calibration box and you have a very accurate uh, navigation of the tip and the trajectory of your endoscope. And then when you remove the trocar and bring the endoscope in, you still have the navigation. So it's very, very useful, especially in cystic cavities where you have no landmarks. Otherwise, usually navigation is just used to get access to the ventricle and then all is done under endoscopic visualization, of course. This is our setup. We have the navigation screen on one side and we have the other screen on the other side. So very convenient to sometimes we stand depending on our mood. So we come to ventricle uh, tumors in the lateral ventricle. When we have a tumor, which is here in front, we would not come from here to go directly to the tumor, but first we go to the ventricle. So we have some space to visualize. When it's too narrow, it's better you come from the posterior trajectory or when the tumor is in the back, you come from here and you have some space in front of you <clears throat> for visualization and orientation. So one example is a 75 year old lady. She was completely confused. She came in with this hydrocephalus, unilateral hydrocephalus on the right side. And you see here's a contrast enhancing lesion and here's another contrast enhancing lesion causing a unilateral 
hydrocephalus because of Raymond Monroe blockade on one side. This is an old lady. You have two, two lesions. So what we suspect is of course a lymphoma. What we did, we go in, you see the foramen Monroe is completely occluded. We first did a wide septostomy to have the communication to the other side. Here we look to the coral plexus on the left side, and then we took a biopsy here. And as expected, it turned out to be a lymphoma. And you see the ventricles came down to normal. She, she was very good in her clinical condition. Then she was sent for oncological treatment to our oncology department. And we could deal both problems, biopsy and CSF circulation problem with one uh, surgery. That is the ideal case for endoscopy, in my opinion. There's another patient. He has a small tumor in the left frontal horn. This tumor was growing in the follow-up over the last three years. And he requested to have a resection. So what is the best approach? The ventricles are small. So usually we would make a transcalosal approach to go there, or alternatively, we make a navigation guided approach transcortical with the endoscope. And that is what the patient wants to have, and what we also recommended because you see the tumor is not well enhancing. It seems to be attached to the head of the corded nucleus here. So that seems to be a good candidate for endoscopy. Although the ventricles are small, we took navigation, planning the approach introduction of the scope and a navigational guidance into the right and uh, into the left frontal horn. And that is what we see. There's a tumor, it's not very well vascularized. You see, it looks good. Here's the posterior part of the tumor. And you see now I use the endoscopic sheath as a retractor. So I push the tumor away to get access to the origin of the tumor at the head of the colloid nucleus. I push the tumor away and then I have good access and I can coagulate the base of the tumor, which is directly at the head of the colloid nucleus. So it's not just to go in with the endoscope, it's really as an instrument, I use the endoscopic sheath. Further coagulation. So my technique is not what is frequently shown, a piecemeal technique, or, or, or I use an ultrasonic aspirator and try to, to remove the tumor step by step. I try to detach the tumor from the wall of the ventricle. And you see here, again, I use my endoscopic sheath as a retractor. I push your tumor in front of the frontal horn. You see, this is a fragment of Monroe and I can get access to the bleeding point very easily. You see, I go into the, into the tip of the endoscope. So it's a small chamber irrigation technique. I irrigate, I have a good view because the small room can be cleared. If the whole lateral ventricle is full of blood, you will not get a good view. So I detach the tumor completely, and then I try to remove the tumor to, through my endoscopic sheath, but it is too small, so I have to remove the, remove the whole system. So endoscope with endoscopic sheath together, and I bring all the tumor out of the cortical puncture channel. And you see, this is a big piece of tumor, and the surgery time is very short. So major criticism, what people say is, oh, it takes so long, I make it with a microscope because you are too, you take too long time. Yes, if you make piecemeal, it takes long. But if you simply detach the tumor and then you grasp it, you are very fast, even faster than with a transcalosal approach because you have no this dissection of the arteries and veins. You see, this is a post-op result, total resection, and turned out to be a sub ependymoma. This was a similar case, came very shortly after the first one. And you look in and see, hmm, left lateral ventricle, a little bit larger, but not too bad, not too much enhancement here. So I thought that is the ideal case, so we do the same. So I go in with my endoscope, but you see the tumor is red. And you see vessel here, vessel here, vessel here. Hmm, looks not so nice like the other one, but I said, okay, let's see what happens. So it's detached to the head of the colloid nucleus on this side but it's also attached to the septum on the other side. So I, I start to detach the tumor from the head of the colloid nucleus, bipolar coagulation, and then I take a grasping forceps and you see it starts to bleed. Then I coagulate again, take a biopsy, starts to bleed. I think, oh, this is a mess. This will not work, it takes hours. So what we should do now, say, okay, we have the dry field technique. So I, we remove the CSF, 
And then I tried to uh, aspirate the cyst, so take a grasping forceps. It was a soft tumor, so initially it worked quite well, but you see it's all blood, it is not effective. So I stopped with the endoscope, I brought the endoscope out and I follow my endoscope track with this tube from Vigor. So this is 12 millimeters in front. And you see now I make a microsurgical resection of this tumor in the dry field. And if you have these bloody tumors, I think it's much better because it just takes too long. You have to irrigate, you don't see, you are not very well uh, orientated. The tumor was also a little bit large. I can take ultrasonic aspiration. I make a septostomy to have a communication to the other side. And then I could resect the tumor uh, very nicely. You see here the fornix is very much involved. We have to dissect by manually. It's more atraumatic to the fornix. And then finally, I could remove the tumor totally. But I think if you have a larger tumor and you feel that your resection is ineffective, and especially if it's bleeding too much, it's no problem. You just convert to an endoscope assisted or microsurgical operation. And you see it's just 12 millimeters. And then we remove, remove the tumor and have this resection. And it turned out to be a neurocytoma. You see, it looks not too bad. It was a lady from Russia. She sent me the images five years after the surgery, no recurrence, all is good. And you see, this is a tract. So it's not too much, not too much damage. So I think the, the use of a tube in cases where your surgery is not very effective is a good alternative. You can use it under the microscope, then you don't have anything inside here. But of course, you can also take an endoscope and, and work in this area. It's up to you. So this is a 35-year-old female. She had headache and had an epileptic seizure. And she has this lesion. Okay, you see, it is iso to CSF in T2 and T1. Then it's suspicious to be an epidermoid. Confirmation is with the diffusion restriction in the B1000 image. You see here, the bright signal, diffusion restriction. That is the proof it is an epidermoid. What is the approach? We make a small approach from the precuneus area, go here with an endoscope and can resect it again. Here, in this case, I use from the beginning this endoscopic tube, as uh, this uh, uh, tube, introduced under navigation. And then I don't use an endoscope because the endoscope takes space. So I just take a big suction and remove the tumor. And then in the end, I take a 30 degree endoscope to look around the corners and remove the remnant of the tumor, which is detached to the ventricular wall under endoscopic visualization. So an endoscope assisted technique, you have both advantages, resect the tumor in that way. And then I remove again the sheath. I bring the cortical margins together. And then I close, usually I close the cortical Cortical to me to avoid subdural collections of CSF. So that is quite good if you have the small tube, just put a little bit fibrin glue, but be careful that it's not running into the ventricle and obstructing the foramen of Monroe. And you see quite good resection. A little bit I had to leave of the capsule attached to the veins here, but otherwise good resection. When I see this case, you see there is very small ventricle. There is no space for an endoscope. This for me is a clear indication to make a microsurgical transcalosal resection. So I think it makes no sense to take an endoscope here because you have no space to put it. Then the microscope is better. Third ventricular tumors, many approaches are available to go in to the third ventricle from all sides. Most of the third ventricular tumors became symptomatic with hydrocephalus. So what we do is just a third ventriculostomy. And in some cases, we take a biopsy. You see, this is a lady, young girl, has a tactile glioma here. Very wide ventricles. You see bulging of the anterior commissure, bulging of the floor. And you see there is a glioma. So ideal case, anatomy is very wide. You go in, you see the floor, the third ventricle translucent, you see the basal P1 segments. It's very important that you always go in front of the basal when you make your ETV. Don't go here behind, although this might be the thinnest part of the floor because there are the perforators running back to the, to the uh, midbrain. And if you rupture one of these perforators, a disaster can happen. So always go in front, 
makes the third ventriculostomy. Of course, for this case, no navigation is required, very wide ventricles, everything is clear. So you open up, and what Ahmed mentioned, it's very important if you see the, the uh, liliquist membrane, this should be fenestrated as well. If, if you don't fenestrate this, the uh, third ventriculostomy will not work and you will have an occlusion of the ventriculostomy in the floor because the CSF pulsations will not work when you have no communication to the prepontine system. And then always we use the 30 degree endoscope to check whether we really reached the subarachnoid space and not the subdural space. So those are forward procedure. We don't take a biopsy if you see a tactile glioma non-enhancing because we know of the benign nature of these tumors. And I follow many patients more than 15 years, no growth at all in these tumors sometimes. If you have small ventricle, if you have a small foramen of one row, of course, when you have a, a tumor here, you cannot make an ETV antibiopsy from the same borehole. Then you need two boreholes or you need uh, a flexible scope. If you have a small foramen, then you don't, you cannot tilt it. Sometimes we have very small ventricles. You see here, this is a ventricle exactly in front of the aqueduct causing hydrocephalus. This is an ideal case I would not make an ETV and then take the tumor biopsy because no, we just make one approach from an anteriorly located borehole just behind the hairline to have a good trajectory to the posterior part of the third ventricle. You see this is a mammillary body here and very easy within five minutes from the beginning, you are here in front of the tumor. And you see, this is the uh, habina commissure, posterior commissure and the tumor is exactly in front of the aqueduct. And because it's small, it's very easy to resect it. You just take a biopsy, resect the tumor. Hemostasis is achieved with bipolar coagulation. And then we can get a total resection of this tumor, although there is some bleeding. It's no problem. Coagulation, bipolar, and then step-by-step -step resection of the tumor. So if you have small tumors, of course, endoscopy allow a gross total resection of these tumors and you avoid any microsurgical procedure. But of course, it should be small ventricles, not too vascular. But you see, this looks very good and it turned out to be an ependymoma. That I, that I was mentioning already, if you have a tumor in the posterior part of the third ventricle and hydrocephalus, you want to make an ETV and to take a biopsy. In this case, when the foramen of Monroe, and you see it on the pre-op MRI is large, then we put the borehole not ideal for the ETV. That means in front of the coronal suture, and we go two centimeters in front. And then you can reach both of these regions without damaging the fornix. If the foramen is very small, then please don't do it. See, small foramen, it's no go. You need two approaches if you have only to uh, if you don't have a if you only have a rigid endoscope. So here's a case where we could do both from one approach. We make an ETV and take a biopsy. You see ventricles came down. You wait for histology and then you decide what to do. This was an interesting case. There was a 24-year-old male, severe deterioration of visual acuity, visual field, and pan hypopit. And you see, that is an unusual lesion. What is this? See, the pituitary gland is very thick. The stalk is thick, but all the chiasm is also enhancing and bulging. So initially, you were thinking, hmm, is this optic pathway glioma, but how, how is the vent, how is the pituitary gland thick? So it was not clear what it is. Initially, we were thinking to take an endonasal biopsy, but then we said, probably this patient will require radiation. And then we have the problem to get a CSF leakage because is, is, is it, is it, the, the region is exactly where they make the radiation. So that's why the decision was made. I said, it's better we come and make a transventricular biopsy. But you see the ventricles are very narrow. Left is a little bit wider than the right one, but still narrow. And then I think it's clear you use navigation. You want to have navigation to, to go to the ventricle. So navigation was used. We go into the ventricle, it's the right lateral ventricle. And then in the depths, you see already the lesion here. 
And from and here you see already this could be a germinoma. It looks suspicious like a germinoma from the color. And so now you see when I have a small ventricle, I go back with my endoscope to have control over the sheath. This is a little otoscope. And then I can go in pushing the phonix away and I have no risk that I damage your phonix. You should not have the lens in front because then you don't know what you what you do with the with the margin of the uh, endoscope. You should always go a little bit back and then you see very nicely where you are. You see, we take a biopsy from this lesion, just a little bit hemorrhage. Don't know coagulation. So before you take the biopsy, you should not coagulate because the pathologist will see, oh, it's just necrosis or carbonization. So first we take the biopsy, even if it's bleeding, and then in the end, we make hemostasis to have a very good specimen for the pathologist. And you see, although it's a very small ventricle, it is very safe to go in with an endoscope if you measure the, the size of the foramen and you see there's no damage to the fornix, no damage to the veins and no damage to the coral plexus. And this turned out to be a galbinoma and you see after radio chemotherapy, the lesion was completely gone. So another case, this was an 84 year old male, incidental finding after minor hit injury. You see, that seems to be a craniopharyngioma, 84 years. He has no symptoms. So we said, oh, just we follow it. So this was June 2000. And then November 2000, you see, asymptomatic still, but large. So what we should do, I think now we should not wait until he has a problem because he, he had already a little bit ventricular dilation. So we make another navigation scan and then we make an endoscopic approach from above. So 48 years old, it's just a cyst which makes problems. We go in, you see the typical craniopharyngioma, some calcification, bipolar coagulation. You see the typical content comes out. So we take an aspiration tube, aspirate most of it. Typical small crystals here. So we evacuate the cyst, open it, and then we evacuate it with a suction tube and then we make a resection. But of course we make not a gross total resection because in these cases, if you take all the tumor out, you will destroy the stalk. And this patient is endocrinologically completely normal. I mean, he's 84. So I would never do a radical resection. That's why we make the choose, we choose the uh, transventricular approach. You just want to open the cyst, and then you have seen there's a second cyst compressing the brain stem. So we make a wide opening in the first cyst, and then we go with our endoscopic sheath into the second cyst. And you see here's the clivus. Here you see the basala, and here sees the other membrane. This is the second membrane. Of the cyst, what you have seen on the pre-op image, here's the basal artery, mammillary bodies. So, so we resect also this membrane, make a wide opening with grasping forceps, and then another coagulation. And then we just stopped. So the problem of this white thing is uh, of this compression of the series of pathways is solved. You see phonics is intact, plexus is intact, all good. And this is a remnant what we left. You see here along the stalk, tumor left. And then we sent him, what we always do in these cases, to radiation. It's a fractionated stereotactic high precision radiation, 56 or 54 grays usually. And you see how the tumor is shrinking. Six months after radiation, almost gone. And then he came this year, 18 months later, you see no tumor remnant visible. So radiation is a very effective treatment option in our experience. Of course, we have mainly adult patients, but so far I have never seen a recurrence in our adult patients who received this type of radiation, never. And we follow them more than some more than 20 years already. So this is, in my opinion, very good because this guy does not need any substitution of hormones. He has no DI. So for me, that is the right choice. 
This is a different case, a 20 year old male, headache, fatigue, decrease in performance, partial pituitary insufficiency. You see a large tumor filling the whole third ventricle. If you look from the lateral side, huge tumor. So what is the best approach in this case? In this case, of course, young patient, solid tumor, we make the decision to make anonasal approach because this is a chiasm, this is a gland. So I have almost one centimeter space between the chiasm and the gland. Here you see chiasm, gland, longitudinal axis of the tumor is in this direction. So this should be ideal. So we make an anonasal approach. Here's a left optic nerve, right optic nerve. Here's a carotid pituitary gland. Dura already open. You see here branches of the superior hypophysal artery. These should be preserved. So we open the, the infundibulum. This is no tumor capsule. This is all normal infundibulum and the tumor is inside. So finding the right plane is of utmost importance as usual in neurosurgery. Debugging of the tumor with ultrasonic aspiration to get some space. And then here, this is all normal infundibulum. So it's an intra-infundibular tumor. And you see the tumor is not coming down. So I use the 45 degree endoscope, traction, counter traction to dissect the tumor. And you see, I don't end up in the white hypothalamus. It's always a gliotic yellow plane. Only this, that's why I resected the tumor because I did not end up in the white hypothalamus. If you see white tissue, I would stop. Otherwise patient might get hypothalamic damage and become obese. You see, I had to bend my suction because I could not reach the upper pool of the tumor. It was sticky here at this area in the upper part of the third ventricle. Here's the fornix coming. And only after I have detect, detached the tumor completely, I remove the tumor because otherwise, if you just pull, you might cause really problems because it might be adherent to the vasculature in the depths. So you see gross total resection. This is the roof of the third ventricle. This is the entrance of the aqueduct, foramen of Monroe. And then, of course, fat nasoceptal plaque. So this is also an option, of course, for interventricular tumors to come endonasally. And he's doing fine. He's completely pan hypopit, although I preserved the stalk. But you have seen it was an intra-infundibular tumor and the stalk was just this very thin layer of, of uh, tissue around. But he did not get obesity. He was not obese. And with testosterone substitution, his girlfriend was again happy with him. What is with the fourth ventricle? Fourth ventricular tumors, I think it's not a good indication for endoscopy. Of course, you can go with a flexible scope and take a biopsy through the aqueduct, but to resect the tumor, like here in epidermoid, you see it goes to from Lushka on both sides. I think this is clearly microsurgery because there is no space. So a telovela approach is what we usually do in these cases. I think in the matter of time, I will stop this is microsurgery that so we remove the tumor completely. So when should we use what? There's some papers what we wrote about interventricular tumors, if somebody is interested. When we start, why and when endoscopy? When we have small ventricles, most of the time we use a microscope if it's a larger tumor. If it's a small tumor, we can also use an endoscope. If you take a biopsy in small ventricles, you always use a little, little lotter scope. When we have large tumors, hydrovascular, of course, microscope is more effective. If you have small tumors, which are purely vascularized, endoscope is an option. Firm consistency, also microscope is better, in my opinion, than the endoscope. And for the fourth ventricular tumors, even if there is cystic component, I think I would not go through the cerebellum. I open the telovela way, and then I use a microscope for tumors in the lateral ventricles, large in the third ventricle, if they are dilated. Endoscopy is an ideal choice. So my conclusion is ventricular approaches is individual decision, decision making depending on what we see. Endoscopy when there's hydrocephalus and a biopsy. Microsurgery for transcalosal approaches when I have small ventricles and larger tumors, of course, that is an ideal approach for larger ventricles. We start frequently with an endoscope. If it is ineffective, as I have shown you, we switch to the tube and make a microsurgical resection. Thank you for your attention. Marvelous. Thank you, Henry. That was uh, superb. I mean, really some fantastic tips and principles there and some exemplary cases um, and some really firework cases, which uh, really um, makes you feel that more and more this should be a subspecialty. 
Um, because there's not uh, much questions there, I'm just going to ask if you don't mind a question which is important for me. And but following a couple of comments, the, the Vicor retractor which you showed there, it's lovely, and I've 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 used them. The problem with them is that they about I think 400 pounds a shot, and you need a whole range of them on the shelf to know what size, length, and width you you use. So, and uh, will betide you if you if you order one or two, thinking that's the size you're going to need. Um, uh, and then, you know, it must be the, the right size. So just a sort of uh, comment, maybe. The other is... No, no, but Mamzua, you just need not all. There are, there's one, it's very wide, 25. You never know, you never uh, use it. There's one, just the smallest one, and you just need five or seven centimeters. So the short one, I also don't use. Five or seven. So you need just four. Great tip. Thank you for that. No, that's great. And and this is really the question when I ask it, uh, it's to everybody and please feel free maybe from yourself and then Basil and then Ahmad. And it's about the choice of scope. And the reason why I mentioned this is not just, look, it's a great scope, the lotter. I love it um, when I've used it. And I love the, um, the blunt tip. It's so smooth and you can push things around and absolutely it makes instinctive sense to use that than the tip of a, uh, an endoscope following putting in a sheath. The advantage with the sheath is that because people feel they've put it in, they've got access, they can take the scope in and out easily. Um, and on the rare occasions, just like you've shown, when you grab a lesion and you've dissected it and it's so big and you want to take it out, you have to take out the whole scope. And then, of course, you have to put it back in. And, and sometimes it's not so easy. Um, so my question to you and the whole panel is, what scope do you use and how important it is, is it to use the same scope and not to switch from one to, to, to another, perhaps, if, if that's okay? Please, Henry, I mean, what scope do you prefer? I know, of course, I know we love the lotter, but any, any principles behind why you advocate this? Thanks. Yeah, I, I just make the differentiation between the larger and the, and the smaller scope. And then, of course, it depending what you're dealing with. When you have small ventricles, you should take, of course, a small scope. And when you just take a biopsy, the lotter is fine. You don't need a bigger one. And of course, when you when you think you are ineffective and you have a tumor, what you initially think you cannot remove it, of course, you can switch and take the little lotter out and bring the larger lotter in to resect the tumor completely. But I think in most of the cases, I can predict which one is a better scope. Thank you for that. Maybe Basil, I mean, you know, there's some big, nice, wide, <laughs> multi-port scopes around now, but any, any comments about that? Uh, I mean, I, I completely agree. It's it's basically having a big and a small scope. I very much loved, the Little Lotto was probably one of my truly most favorite scopes. We can't use it here because of the whole CE marking. I uh, had one that broke and therefore they won't give me another one until they fix the CE marking side of it. Um, I therefore moved to the uh, Oscillap, min the Minop intraventricular. So that was that's the smaller one, which is unfortunate because it's a six millimeter outer channel. Whereas with the little lotter, when I, when I took all the outer sheath and so on, it was it was tiny. It was something like three point something millimeters. Um, and I use the invent. The invent is my workhorse for the big tumors because I really like the the elliptical uh, channel. I think it's a three point seven by six point four. But equally, I have also used the lotter before when we were still using it. Um, the issue was the the endoscopic aspirator that I I would have needed to to to, to break off a piece at the top of the lotter to be able to allow the. Um, uh, I know Henry's looking at me like it's I, I, <laughs> like I blasphemed. I apologize, but I did need to do that to allow the soaring to stick out of the uh, at the tip of the uh, of the lotter. Uh, but I think now they've made adaptation and modifications. I hope they make it. Uh, so that it, it fits the lot easier it's on the way yes it is yeah i thought they were working with you um so uh so yeah definitely and in terms of the vicor retractors i think i agree again with henry we always have them on the shelf but it's i never have the small ones because they're immaterial it's normally the medium and the large and they tend to be the 17 21 and i can't remember if it's a 28 but i very rarely go above the 21 uh but they're really useful for when you have to open 
Thank you very much. And um, Ahmad, please make a comment. I, I, also, if you also any comment on the irrigation you use as well. Sorry. The problem is that I started back in '93 with endoscopy, and the available endoscopes were then the one of GAP and the one of Kamert, and then the smaller uh, version of Kamert, and then DEC. I went through all these, <laughs> and then uh, the Esculap, you know, and and and. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm more accustomed and more comfortable with the uh, old gap so far. Thank you for that. Uh, a quick question to all of you, just very quick. Do you is consider it essential to fix the head in doing the surgery? And what irrigation do you use? Do you use normal cell? Do you use Hartman's? Do you think it big, makes a big difference? So for EGV, usually we did not fix the head, but we had one case where the anesthesiologist yeah. did not have a good anesthesia and he was <coughs> moving when the endoscope was in the head. Fortunately, nothing happens, but this shows that there is a risk. So when I go for an ETV, I say, please make, com make complete relaxation so I don't need to fix it with the, clamp, with the, with the pins. But if you're in doubt, you can fix it. It does not take any, any good, big effort. Maybe it's safer. After this experience, I was a little bit concerned. And irrigation, we use usually a ringer's solution. When we, when we irrig if we irrigate a lot in tumors, we make it uh, warm body temperature. But if you have just an EGV and you know, usually you don't irrigate much, then we just take a syringe and irrigate. Um. Basil, Ahmad, any comments about that, particularly temperature of the irrigation? Because you can get a, you know, a hypertensive tachycardic yeah. response. Definitely, body temperature ringer. Body temperature ringer. And as regards fixing the head, totally depends. Um, preferably in pediatric age group, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, I do not resort to any pins. Uh, with, a, with the anesthetist, of course, doing his job, with all my due respect. <laughs> <laughs> um, you don't want to do awake endoscopic uh, neurosurgery. <laughs> um, I think I agree fully. I, I don't normally fix for the endoscopies. I've regretted it a couple of times because of uh, uh, some pressure sores from doing operations far too long, but these are for really big tumors. Um, and on only one occasion have I had the, it, it was not as much movement, but a patient was seizing. And it was the only time I used a neuro, an interruptive kind of neuromonitoring uh, uh, neurophysiologist who wasn't the one that I normally use. And they were just overstimulating way too much. And I've seen ventricles collapse on you when you're in the middle of an operation because of seizures it is not a pleasant thing. So would that have made a difference? No, the ventricles collapsing was more the issue uh, because of the pressure rather than the movement. And the wash, I yeah, Hartman, you know, Ringer's lactate. Um, I've used a lot. I, you know, I, I with the longest operation we've done, we used a total of 99 liters. Wow. Uh, wow. Yeah, we, we had a case, it was a girl with an arachnoid cyst, Sylvian cyst, and this was really sticky. And there was small bleeding all the time. And we had the same, we irrigate a lot. I, I think this was not so much, but I think at least two liters or three. And I did not take care. And the nurses, you know, this is a this is a disadvantage to have an interdisciplinary OR. They were from general surgery. They gave us saline, and I did not ask because our nurses never give saline. And then the patient wanted to be should be uh, extubated and was hyperventilating, completely completely hyperventilating, and they had to intubate him again or her, and then. Slept one night, then CSF was reproduced, and it, it was uh, okay. Yeah. But this can happen, yeah. So saline, if you make abundant irrigation, you destroy the all yeah. internal environment. Yeah. I think this, this is the reason why I'm, I'm asking this, because I've worked in quite a few centers, and when people have used saline and they've used irrigation, and, and they don't, it, you can get this tachycardia hypertensive response. And of course, I remember the late Professor Goodrich, I mean, one of the biggest things he used to tell was Cushing had always advocated um, that you know, normal cell on is toxic. Um, so yeah. lactate or Hartman's is, you know, it, 
But please, any comments, Basil, about that? Uh, no, for me, I, I, I know what 99 litres sounds like, and I, I, I <laughs> therefore try not to say it. And now I've made the mistake of saying it, and it's not in secret either. Which uh, So I didn't start with that. I obviously built up to it. So when I first hit, I still remember the, the increments. I hit 11, and I was thinking, oh, my God. I hit 13, and I thought, well, now we're pushing it. And then at one point, it was 40-something. And this operation particularly was about 12 hours worth of operating and the issue, the only thing I would say is this was wash that was going in quickly and coming out quickly because I had a sucker inside that was on really high uh, suction. So the, the, the wash is not taking that much time to stay inside. So it was literally in and out, in and out, in and out the whole time. But if you do it with a small scope, it's dangerous. So that's the only thing. If you use the irrigation machines and they do it on a mine of intraventricular or on a little lotter, let's say, or, or something like that. The fluid doesn't come out as quickly and you can cause major, you know, major trouble. Yeah. Thank you all for those tips. Um, perhaps what we could do is go, there is a question actually um, from Raja regarding, um, in fact, this is more of a pituitary adenoma question. So not so much CSF, but it's worth, it's, uh, the question is firm and highly vascular pituitary adenoma. Any tips for transphenoidal approach? Um, I think this is perhaps best from the skull based side, but Henry, uh, do you want to make any comments or Ahmad? Um, a firm yeah. and highly vascular pituitary adenoma, any tips for transfer order approach? I'm sure there's lots if of things. If the tumor is firm, you, you can go around a pseudo capsule usually. You can grasp the tumor and can dissect in this pseudo capsule. And, and usually it should not be so much bloody. What, what I had, the bloody tumors were tumors which were pretreated in prolactinoma. They were very fibrous and bleeding and also when they are very soft. And if the tumor is bleeding a lot, of course, and is soft, I just try to suck as quick as I can all the tumor away. If you know, sometimes bleeding only stops if the tumor is gone. That is what I usually do. But if the tumor is firm, and it's bleeding, you can coagulate usually because it's 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 not soft and uh, suckable. And then I try to find a pseudo plane, a pseudo capsule to go around. So, but to be honest, in pituitary tumors, I had never the big problem that there was so much hemorrhage. It was always a nightmare with the prolactinomas when they were pre, pre treated with dopamine agonists because then they're very fibrous. And in these cases, I had some, some bleeding. Of course, when you have tumor in the cavernous sinus and you follow the tumor, and then you come to the end of the tumor, then it starts to bleed from the cavernous sinus. This can happen, and this can bleed a lot. And then usually I just use flow seal or I put some uh, gel foam in and compress it. It's not, it should not be a major problem. No, absolutely, thank you. Um, uh, as you say, it is, um, as one mentor used to say to me, all bleeding always stops. Yes, finally it all uh, stops. <laughs> it's getting stopped in time and quickly, and it's pretty, pretty uh, good, easy to do that. I think in pituitary surgery. But anyway, lovely to share those that, those tips. Without further ado, Basil, would you like to um, share your experiences? Thank you so much. Wonderful. Um, I'll try and be quick. You guys have already uh, had it from uh, truly the experts and uh, those I've uh, looked up to uh, certainly before I started doing this as a consultant. Let me just make sure. I think I've just uh, shared the. Uh, uh, yeah, that was uh, the incorrect presentation. There we are. No problem. Take your time. It's fine. So um, it's just a little bit of kind of going over what we've just discussed uh, pretty much. And it's really good to see that there are lots of things that obviously I am doing exactly as uh, uh, those I have always looked up to, other things doing slightly differently. Um, and I'm really keen to hear both uh, uh, Professor Schroeder and Professor Zohdi's uh, opinions on, on those. Just a quick disclosure, we do some endoscopy and neurosurgery courses. We've got some sponsorship as a result of that, some honoraria from Medtronic. That's not why I use the axiom left, right and center. I think it was the other way around <laughs> that came after. Uh, and just wanted to say once more, congratulations to Mansour for all his hard work in making this CSF section, uh, uh, well, a section. Um, so very quickly, uh, what we're looking at here really is 
CSF disorders, uh, and it's 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 an obstructive pathology within the ventricular system. That means you know the endoscope has uh, has relevance, um, and the obstructive pathology can be within the ventricles and it can be paraventricular and impinging on uh, the ventricular system and the and the and the channels within. Um, and really the ethos is either endoscopic bypass, i.e. an ETV, which is a, the most common thing that we do endoscopically, or resection, really it's an and or resection of the lesion to relieve the obstruction. So the most common thing is an ETV with obstruction distal to the anterior third ventricle. I've heard sometimes people say, those who don't do endoscopy, they say, oh, we're doing an ETV for a colloid. And you think not every endoscopy is an ETV, it's a, you know, a colloid, the obstruction is is proximal to all this. Sometimes you do need to do an ETV after you've taken a colloid out, but there's a lot of nuances there and we won't go into that too much. So the most common reason to do an ETV is a web or a stenosis. We're not going to talk about that because we're talking about lesions here. So really it's intraventricular tumors or lesions such as low-grade gliomas, craniopharyngiomas, high-grade gliomas, germ cell tumors, pineal parenchymal tumors. These are the most common. We've all seen cavernomas uh, presented earlier and other weird and wonderful dermoids and, and epidermoids and so on. Colloids, I, I, I put there, but we've already discussed them before. I think I've got one example just to, to show what it was like uh, for a lesion that didn't look like a colloid, actually. Um, ETV alone for lesions distal to the aqueduct. So this is exactly what Professor Schroeder uh, was saying earlier in terms of the fourth ventricular tumors. Are we really going to go in and try and take these out endoscopically? Well, is there any relevance? Is there any benefit? And at the moment, I cannot really see the, re the, the, the a justification for that. Occasionally, you have tumors that wrap around the whole brainstem, come out to the floor of the third and might come out through the aqueduct. You might be able to get a biopsy. Um, and we're not going to talk about hemorrhage and and and, and infection, and uh, exactly as uh, uh, as as Professor Schroeder had done earlier, but rather than at the end, I did it at the beginning. I still use obviously microscopic techniques for um, for for ventricular tumors, but mainly the fourth ventricular tumors. And I'll just scroll very quickly through that because it's exactly the same as everyone else does it. Well, the majority of people telovela. I appreciate some people will go through the vermis. This is for a brainstem exophytic tumor, so a paraventricular tumor causing. Not obstruction yet, but at risk of causing obstruction. And this was a pilocytic that we managed to debulk. It's a um, th that sagittal in the midline you can see is uh, very very quickly. If you compare the parasagittal with the sagittal, how uh, often people can make it look like you've done a complete resection when you haven't. This is a subtotal resection. We left the bit that was a bit tricky with the um, with the monitoring and when cardiovascular instability ensued. Uh, and the child has done very well since we used a little bit of. Uh, uh glyalan as well and that's an issue at the moment that sometimes when i want to use glyalan i can't really use it with the endoscopic approach with a pilocytic you could argue well why are you using glyalan or the pilocytic what i found is that the area of the brainstem that's thinnest fluoresces for some reason and i've given it uh, in a lot of children now i don't really give it for pilocytic astrocytomas but this was at the beginning of the experience that we had with uh, with glyalan uh so um this is Basically, what I started using when I first started doing endoscopy, this was the Medtronic kind of workhorse for me. And I was really disappointed when they stopped making it. But actually, this was probably the best thing that happened to us. Uh, you can see it was quite basic. The visualization was really bad and uh, the instruments were lacking. Um, then we went and sought uh, out the best scopes we can get. And you've heard already the L Little Lotta and the Lotta were very much uh, my favorite scopes. But then we had to kind of stop using those. And we've been using the Invent and the Minop intraventricular much more. Um, and the channel is, is a 3.7 by 6.5 millimeters oval channel. And you can do by manual manipulation. Um, the, the setup at the tip of the Oscillap is... is <coughs> It's great in the sense that you can change the optics. So as a result, if you want to change from big to small or small to big, all you need to do is just take that sheath off and then put the other sheath on. So you're not desterilizing and so on. But the issue with that is obviously the the, the shape is kind of is asking to cause injury inside. So you have to really be careful. And it's not something that I can just give a registrar or a trainee straight away without really going through the motions of, of safety and, and how to use it. And it's a 30 degree channel so that you can see the instruments coming out of the 
the kind of the fish mouth where the channel is, but you still have one or two millimeters where you don't see the uh, instruments. These are the instruments and we're working with various companies to try and see if they can help us develop better instrumentation. But certainly bipolar was 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 a was a landmark in this uh, because without bipolar bipolar diathermy, we wouldn't be able to do a lot of what we're doing. We were using um, NG tubes initially as suckers, uh, but then I'm very glad to see that uh, um, uh, Oscarlab developed their, their own sucker, but they say you need to really use a syringe with it. What we do is connect it to the wall. We use it exactly in the same way as we do with microscopic surgery. And then we talked about the ultrasonic aspirator, and that's a soaring aspirator, which I think was nearing kind of being discontinued at one point, although I, I will stand corrected if... Uh, anyone knows otherwise, but then when everyone started using it more and more, uh, I think, um, uh, well, uh, I'm glad to say that there's been further development. Uh, and I took the hint earlier that Professor Schroeder is working with, uh, with them to develop it for the lotter now, which would be uh, absolutely great. So this is what we have to do is just dismantle it to make it fit down the Oscalap. Um, and uh, these are some of the alternatives. So the brain path uh, and using a Nico Myriad, I personally would rather not use it just because although we are going to try it, uh, it once more but it's it's a debrider and it can be quite um, quite aggressive um this is some of our developments we developed a probe for monitoring um we've changed it around a little bit now uh, and um, and and essentially you can do you can go in through the endoscope with the probe and map various parts of the ventricles initially i thought well there's csf everywhere or fluid you're not going to get anything at all uh, and now, actually, by just mapping the floor of the lateral ventricle, you can find where the internal capsule is likely to be um, in relation to, you know, tumors that you're trying to get into that way. It's really useful for thalamic tumors specifically if you're trying to get onto them from the top. You'll see us use it in, in one of the videos uh, uh, shortly. This this is more about the endoscopic aspirator, not the total uh, uh, the totality of our experience in intraventricular and paraventricular tumors, but it does more or less summarize the types of pathology that we're using, because I, I was, I know Giuseppe Cianali is 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 a, a prolific uh, uh, pub, uh, kind of publisher of, of of experience with the soaring, and he's been very selective. Uh, I have not been. I've used it in in everyone where I thought, well, there's a tumor or a lesion, and I'm going in with an endoscope, and you know, is it useful or is it not useful? So we had up to about June, about 58 procedures all monoportal and we documented usefulness in, in the majority of them. And we found that basically in half or just over, it was useful. Increasingly, I use the sucker a lot more, but actually there are times when the endoscopic ultrasonic aspirator is a game changer. Uh, we were able to do purely endoscopic gross total or near total resection in about 16 of the of the operations. That's due to the nature of the tumors. They're not tumors that you normally you want to go in and take the whole tumor out. They often can be um, optic pathway hypothalamic gliomas that we're dealing with uh, or thalamic glioblastomas, so on and so forth. We did splitting of the choroid fissure actually in over 55 patients, probably more now. Uh, this is for the posterior third ventricle, occasionally for the anterior third ventricle. And you saw a beautiful um, a slide from Professor Zohdi uh, about the, the framing of Monroe and where's safe and where's less safe. And I think by coagulating and sacrificing the anterior septal vein and splitting the anterior aspect of the choroid fissure, uh, we've just gained a lot more space and therefore perhaps handled the fornix less. Although in some of the uh, videos that, that, that you'll see, um, uh, you could argue that actually there's more handling of the fornix throughout its length because you're trying to put a dissector underneath and lift it off. Um, but we'll talk about that as well. The factors that dictated the extent of resection were the location of the tumor, the consistency, how vascular it was, the type of histology, and also the instrumentation that we had. This is the majority of the uh, of the uh, intraventricular pathology. As I said, there are a few more where we didn't use the soaring at all. So you can see that it's mainly pilocytic astrocytomas uh, and craniopharyngiomas, uh, and then <clears throat> the rest would be the slightly less common ones. Although if you group all of the pineal region tumors together, that's a big component as well. But that's because of the uh, pediatric practice that I have as well, pediatric teenage young adult in addition to the adults. You can see that there's also, I've had a choroid plexus cyst, cavernomas uh, and some ependymomas and spindle cell oncocytomas that had gone all the way up. These were tricky because they can be quite uh, uh, hemorrhagic. 
so in terms of where we use it, well, lateral ventricles, you could argue that's the easiest. So if you're going to go in, big lateral ventricles and the tumor, best place to do it. Um, however, you end up with a tumor like this, which in maximal diameter was about eight, um, around eight or nine centimeters. Um, and this was a meningioma. I thought it was going to be a cortex papilloma, but um, it, but it wasn't. We still dealt with it in the same way. So I'll just show you the uh, the video here. So we've gone in through the back. Um, this is with the invent, and this is the bipolar of the invent. This is the, uh, the, the the supply we thought to the tumor. Um, and what we do in there is just buzzing the, the, the pedicle, lifting it up a little. And then with the scope, we just had to get a registrar who's quite happy to hold the scope with me so that I could go in by manual and just and cut. I think you could argue is more about just demonstrating that one can do this by manually. It, uh, often now, I just most of the time, I just move my left hand with the scope uh, and, and then move the instruments uh, with the right hand. Um, and this is just trying to separate it from the thalamus and the, the uh, and the walls um, of the ventricle. This, as I said, it was a meningioma, relatively tough in, in some parts calcified. We pushed and pushed and pushed, uh, but the reality was it was never really going to come purely endoscopically. We staged this operation. We had the immediate, uh, uh, I, uh, we stuck an EVD and did a little bit of endoscopy to debulk and so on, uh, and then uh, two further stages to get the whole thing out. But you can see even with the Vicor retractor that you've seen used earlier, this was something that was really very much stuck. And you do get those with children for one reason or another, where they end up growing to a, a large uh, size uh, within the ventricles. So this is after the first operation, and then there was two further stages, and that's uh, uh, that's not a residual. And certainly if it's a residual, we think it's one that's stable and hasn't grown. It's been now about five or six years. And that's the track that's uh, uh, the, the way it looks now. Um, and that's an anterior third ventricular lesion, uh, but with an abnormal corpus callosum and with uh, open leaves of the uh, septum pellucidum. So this has gone through the leaves of the septum. And I was thinking along the line of potentially something like an optic pathway uh, hypothalamic glioma. But of course, you go in and it looks like a like a colloid system. You can see the bulge here through the through the uh, 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 septum pellucidum. Um, so um, just because we're not really going to talk about colloysis too much, I will speed through it a little. And you can see we just suck in the capsule there. We're, we're removing the capsule as well. Uh, and you often can twist. Um, you you got to be careful how much to pull, of course, because you could be pulling a lot of the veins inside. Um, so twisting motion, some people called it after themselves with their surnames. Other people called it a spaghetti move and so on and so forth. I uh, would just say twist the, bipo the, the biopsy forceps uh, because what it does is it crimps the vessels and it, and it allows you hemostasis to an extent. Knowing how much to push, I'd love to tell you that I always know that, you know, when to stop. But the reality is sometimes you pull too much and you get some bleeding and you have to deal with it. This is going through the septum uh, and to get the rest of the colloid cyst that was still stuck there. And because we're not talking about colloids, I will call it a day there. Uh, and that, but you can at least see that the cyst sequences show that we've removed the whole cyst. This was a three centimeter cyst in a in a in a child. Um, we won't go through. Uh, now we're on 14, 15, I think, uh, endoscopic ones. Um, very interestingly, uh, uh, um, uh, Professor Schroeder showed a, an 80-something-year-old with a craniopharyngioma. This is an 86-year-old Scottish lady who used to swim four times a week, very active, started having a little bit of trouble with, uh, with her balance and her memory. And she had this lesion, which turned out to be an optic pathway hypothalamic glioma, which again is very uncommon in this age group, specifically a pilocytic with pilomyxoid features. This is the first time I had the soaring work with me, and it was a bit of a celebration in theater when it started kind of, um, uh, you know, the ultrasound, the ultrasonic aspect of it was working, the suction was working, and we, we were able to do um, a lot more of a debulking than I thought we would. The idea was to go in and do a biopsy, a septum pellucidotomy, and then leave a shunt uh, later, whereas we didn't have to. What we did here is a dry field maneuver that's really useful, I found. Although you've heard I use pressured wash, um, uh, sometimes 50 mils a minute or, or even upwards to 100 mils a minute, but only with the big scope. Um, but often every every big kind of operation uh, on, on with big tumors, I found that I've had to do the dry field maneuver at least once or twice. Um, and you can see that just towards the end there where we suck the CSF and then we've got 
there you can see the tumor so this is more like the uh, microscopic uh, uh, aspect some bruising to the fornix but actually she was quite well with that um, and that's the amount we removed so we didn't go um, hell for leathers with this um, it we just we just took out enough to be able to reestablish the CSF pathways. And then she passed away from a, uh, well, from old age rather than her tumor. This is a papillary craniopharyngioma. So I, I found it quite useful, crani uh, adamantinomatous craniopharyngiomas and papillary craniopharyngiomas to come in from the top if there are big ventricles and certainly if there's hydrocephalus. This is just some pictorial kind of um, uh, run through of uh, the approach from the right lateral ventricle to um, open the choroid fissure. So you can see the anterior septal vein, the choroid plexus, the thalamus striate vein, and then that's the fissure there. And if we go a little bit further, we just see the, uh, the choroid plexus that I've buzzed, the anterior septal vein that's buzzed, and just cutting the anterior septal vein there. Uh, and then you can, it looks like a comma, essentially, at the end. And you can just make it a little wider and allow instrumentation to go inside um, and there. That's the tumor that you can see better. And then um, we left a small residual. That residual grew over time. So they ended up going for, children would normally go for proton beam therapy. He went for the radiotherapy. Um, so one of the other uh, tumors that are common in the uh, anterior third ventricle is an optic pathway hypothalamic glioma. This child was someone whose parents, and the child herself, 10-year-old, she uh, uh, does a lot of uh, uh, acting and, and, and voiceovers. And she's so committed to her, to her well career essentially despite being 10 years old I, i've i've not seen neurosurgeons with this amount of passion and dedication she's phenomenal and she did not want to have radiotherapy which was great actually because the 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 treatment changed from radiotherapy up front to chemotherapy now so the majority of patients will have chemotherapy with these she's had those three lines of chemotherapy and it was still growing so they really were keen to see if there's any targetable mutations but also her ventricles started going up and she started blocking off and we thought, can we go in and debulk and get some uh, um, some pathology? And this is one of the more recent ones, I think, in the last one or two years, and just shows the choroid fissure splitting quite nicely, I think. Um, I do a septum pellucidotomy in a lot of the lesions that are likely to block both for amino of Monroe. I've run into trouble with colloid cysts before where I've gone in and suddenly the ventricle was closing up on me. And I think it was like a one-way valve with fluid going to the other side and pushing the septum. So I try and do the septum pellucidotomy, make sure we're happy uh, and then go in. Uh, you'll see now that's the uh, the monitoring probe. I always try and see what the chordate gives me and it gives me very little. It's always further back where the, where the, where the internal capsule is that, that you'll get normally leg or, or foot or something along those lines. So you can see here the choroid uh, plexus being coagulated, pushed out of the way. And these are the tinea uh, fornices. On the other side, of course, it's a tinea uh, thalami. And you just put a dissector. It has to be the broad dissector, so it's easier with the in with the invent rather than the minop intraventricular. You are buzzing quite close to the uh, uh, to the fornix. We've not had major trouble with that. I think the major trouble is when you're really going to town and trying to lift the fornix up. In those who have already got memory problems, they can transiently worsen and then get better. This is where it's attached to the hypothalamus, essentially. Although we are still quite superior to that so it's more uh the columns of the fornix and it's just buzzing and separating it really um and um uh, trying to get as much debulking as possible and that using the biopsy forceps as we said and often uh with with the ones with the they've got a little rotating kind of knob that you can just push with your finger um and it works quite nicely but if you can't you can ask your assistant to kind of rotate it for you and what we're doing there is just getting the posterior aspect of the tumor away from the posterior third ventricle uh, to try and see the limits. I think this is what's helped me most because sometimes you can't really see the wood from the trees because you're so close. It's, it's like you're still in the forest. You can't really tell. You need this, this bird's eye view. You have to come out a little bit to be able to see. And one way to do that is to try and push the tumor to one side to see where the limits are. Um, and with this, we were quite fortunate that we were able to then um, see all the way back to the posterior third ventricle with, again, the tectal plate, pineal recess, habenular commissure above, uh, and the aqueduct. And it's a small amount that we did. It was only two or three hours operating, and that's the only bit we took out. Um, and uh, that's on the cyst sequence, and you can see the flow on the T2 cube. The T2 cube is very good at showing flow, uh, and, 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 and we're very happy with that result. Um, 
the posterior third ventricle is where the splitting the choroid fissure was much more um, useful, especially of late. We've now been able to take out a similar type of tumor, three centimeter teratoma uh, from a child by splitting the posterior aspect of the choroid fissure. We haven't even had to take out the anterior septal vein. And increasingly, I've been able to kind of develop the technique where we can do that. You have to be careful with the inter internal cerebral veins, of course, but that's the case with pineal tumors. It, it, always it's the veins that you have to be careful with. So that's the fornix here, uh, medially, TNA fornices and the choroid plexus that we've coagulated and pushed down. And then now we're looking towards the fornix and the internal cerebral vein. We're lifting the fornix up um, and that's going in, looking back. Uh, the, the massa intermedia you can divide when it's very thin. Obviously, I wouldn't say with kissing thalami you should be doing that, but with kissing thalami that means that the third ventricle is really small. You shouldn't really probably go in with a with an endoscope to try and do this for a biopsy, perhaps. And this is a typical teratomatous type of tumor. I think my main regret is not being at the right uh, kind of level in my learning curve then to be able to take this out, because um, in the end they went and they had chemotherapy. And they had growing teratoma syndrome. So the benign component got bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, the tumor got to almost 10 centimeters. We had to go in, take that out. He was almost um, about to die. Uh, and we did, we, did a, we did a good job. It was a complete resection. Unfortunately, we didn't opt for radiotherapy at that stage because it was a complete resection. And then it recurred about 10 or 12 weeks later. And, um, and, and, and then he died from his disease about a year after that. Um, uh, and you can see here, as we go in, the combination of soaring, uh, bipolars, and uh, biopsy forceps to try and lift the tumor. Um, similar thing with the posterior third ventricle when it's a thalamic tumor exophytic into the third ventricle. Um, and uh, that's just that kind of example. Uh, this is a child who, with a thalamic glioblastoma, generally speaking, the survival uh, with a child you're looking at three months and it, it, a lot of it is because you're not really debulking much of this tumor. We operated three times and he's had chemo and radiotherapy and he ended up with 24 month survival with good survival, good quality of life. The only times that he was unwell, so he was able to go to school and so on, but the only times he was unwell is when the tumor had recurred enough to cause him symptoms. Um, and with this, we did work very hard and there'll always be those who say, well, what was the point? You know, he, he was gonna die anyway. And you could argue that with a lot of the high uh, high grade or very aggressive tumors, uh, but of course, by that logic, most of us would then stop operating on most adults with glioblastomas, which we don't. We all still give them a chance. Um, so I think we felt it was certainly uh, relevant. I will go just to the um, back of the third. There you are. So we were able to get enough of the tumor uh, so that we could we could open the uh, uh, the aqueduct. Um, and I stented. I thought I was being. Clever, I thought I could prevent. You're always kind of thinking, I don't want to just think about fixing things now. I want to think about what can happen in, in, in a few weeks, in a few months, in a few years. And then I, I, I stuck a stent across the aqueduct because I knew this tumor was going to recur. Uh, and, and it worked until the stent was blocked by, by the tumor. So then I had to go in from the other side and take um, um, a different trajectory and take more of the tumor out. But as you've heard, he's, uh, uh, he's he actually survived for 24 months. This, I... Completely agree with uh, Professor Schroeder. These are the, the, the majority of them never grow. They just stay as they are. And even if they grow, they grow very slowly. Um, I went in to do an ETV. However, I did actually address this tumor. And the reason for that is because although the majority never grow, I had just seen someone whose tumor doubled or tripled in size uh, in, in the matter of, of a few months. And it was a pilocytic astrocytoma still, but we see those sometimes in some of the pediatric and teenage and young adult groups. This is using the old endoscope, the uh, uh, the, the one that I mentioned uh, Medtronic had stopped making um, and uh, really difficult uh, because of the instrumentation. But actually in this situation, it was relatively easier and that was the, the tumor. It was uh, quite cystic, uh, some solid components, and we were able to take uh, the majority of that, go in through the aqueduct and take the bit of um, the um, um, capsule at the bottom of the distal aspect. Um, and and free it all up, and that's there is a residual, but the midline doesn't show uh, doesn't show doesn't really do justice to the residual. Um, same as Professor Zohdi had shown earlier, some cavernomas. Uh, when this child first presented, I said the last thing I ever want to do is have to deal with this 
ever because I just don't know which way to address it uh, unless the ventricles go up and you say it tongue in cheek and you say, well, I hope it never happens. And then the ventricles did go up uh, and uh, we ended up going in, um, uh, splitting the fissure a little and you can see the cavernoma in the midbrain. The midbrain is relatively forgiving as long as the lesion or tumor is pointing towards the floor of the third ventricle. So we buzzed it, we took out as much of the cavernoma as we could, uh, but not all of it. Um, and uh, just an example of a similar case, but with a pilocytic astrocytoma, this is the initial <clears throat> scan. Uh, I'm sure, uh, I, I hope everyone would agree, none of us would ever want to go into this tumor, not microscopically, endoscopically, or in any other way. Uh, the idea was to do a biopsy. She had a biopsy. She ended up with hydrocephalus. We put a um, ventricular peritoneal shunt in um, uh, rather than an ETV because of the shape of the tumor and where it was and where the floor of the third ventricle was. She went and had um, uh, radiotherapy followed by, uh, she only had radiotherapy, no chemotherapy. And then she had radionecrosis and she got, it, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And for about six months, we watched her and she got worse and worse and worse to the point that we were all worried about her dying. Uh, at which point we said, okay, we will go in. Very misleading because I haven't shown you a few scans in between. Essentially, I went in, took about half of it out only because it was pointing to the, um, floor of the third uh, and that allowed us time for the proton beam to work so it was the proton beam that did the work not me the only thing i did was just decompressed enough to allow the child to survive and for us to to to, to be able to kind of reap the, the benefits of the um of the uh proton beam um so have we had any complications um yeah, i mean i've had lots of complications uh as I'm sure many have, and we always try and learn from them. And we always try and avoid any surgery because that's the best way of not getting a complication is not to operate. Uh, when it comes to the endoscopy, I've had less. The reason I have is because I've tried my best really to be, because obviously criticism will come very easily for any endoscopic procedure um, if it's slightly outside the box. Um, and because generally speaking, they've been shorter and I've taken a lot less risk. When you go in microscopically, you almost feel like you're in a position where you have to take a tumor out. And often it's been things like ependymomas, medulloblastomas, so on and so forth, where you do have to get a good clearance or some of the pineal tumors. And that's where we've run into trouble. But Specific to endoscopy, infection, yes. Although, interestingly enough, when we've done really big, long procedures, we haven't had problems with infections as much as one would think. Um, I, bleeding, yes, three pineals out of over 30, and the majority of those had endoscopic followed by some form of microscopic, except for a handful. The ones that have run into trouble have been normally over 65 um, and it's normally a bleed that either caused some uh, trouble with uh, the reticular activating system, uh, or even in a 79-year-old uh, gentleman, uh, uh, he in the end did not survive. Uh, I've had some transient worsening of memory in those who already have deficits, but this has always recovered. Um, and we've had some transient limb weakness when I first started doing the transcoroid, probably because of pressure on the thalamus. Uh, the cognitive slowing for 24 to 48 hours, I'm sure that's the wash uh, and the fact that it's a long procedure. Uh, so uh, is it really still an innovation as such? I mean, people have been doing endoscopy and neuroendoscopy for, for, for years and years and years, but I think it's developing more better instrumentation, better techniques and so on and so forth that's allowing us to do more. Whether truly it's the right thing or not, it's the only way we can tell is by always sharing the experience and, and, and keeping an open mind. And although thinking outside the box is great, it's important sometimes not to, um, you know, if you have a hammer to look at everything as, as if it's a nail. Uh, so I hope I haven't taken too long. I've rushed through it a little bit because I'm conscious of time and I'm grateful to, to everyone uh, for their attention. Excellent. Um, that's already marvelous. Some phenomenally good cases there. Uh, and um, the pediatric service, I'm, I'm sure, and the adults are, uh, Really lucky to have you there and, and the whole team. Um, Mansoor, I, I, I have a question to you, Bess. Please, please. Actually, something which worries me a lot, uh, this track that we do when we use not only the endoscope, the conduit or the uh, endoscope assisted microsurgery, uh, the track, how long does it take to coapt again? Do you have any idea? To contract? Yeah, 
and, and apart from co-opting, co uh, what makes it develop to, into a porencephalic cyst or whatever, or encephalomalacia, and a very ugly yeah. uh, MRI that we had promised the, 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 the relatives and the patient himself that we are minimally invasive. And of course, the, the, the slides that we all show, I mean, with all my due respect, again, <laughs> most of us show, are the slides of the pre and post without showing this track. So can you comment on that? So immediately after, we do a, normally an MRI the day after, and that MRI is the one that I would say I tend to ignore a little, although it shows you how much movement you've done as well, because it will show you the white matter changes. And if you look at, you know, um, not necessarily diffusion, but flare will, will, will overstate that. And because when you've got the endoscope inside, you're moving it quite a bit from side to side then uh, it does it does cause that reaction. In some of them, you can argue you end up with some scar tissue. And I've had some that remained open for about, you know, so a centimeter or thereabouts. Most of them have collapsed down just because that's what the brain does. Um, but uh, it tends to do that after a few months. It doesn't do it immediately after. So it's normally six months to a year, and then you don't really see that much of a track. It's a few millimeters, but you don't. it doesn't stay open. In some of them, it has. But I haven't had huge... Um, a huge kind of porencephalic type uh, pictures. But I think that's because it, normally you get that as you start developing a bit more hydrocephalus inside, and then you have to go in and, and, and deal with it and, and fix that problem. But I'm sure in time, I'm going to end up with pictures of that. Those who already have a very little brain and they've had parts of the tumor that's kind of presented itself in a way like that, yes. And the things that I've struggled with are subdurals actually. And especially in kids with very small cortical mantle. So that would be, yeah, that, that would be one of the bigger problems. But I've had that even with ETVs and some of the really young ones. Uh, so when you operate on those who are a few weeks old and, and, and if they've got very small, vent very big ventricles, very small volume of brain, they're the ones that end up with huge subdurals. And then you end up putting a subdural peritoneal shunt. And then you think, would it have been better to just put a shunt in? Although then you put a shunt in intraventricular in others and you end up with subdural with subdural uh, fusions and then you have to you have to put extra holes to drain the subdurals as well is there any 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 trick or something i mean i, I can't give any advice uh, to to prevent such a, such an event and, and and as you mentioned of course i fully agree in pediatric age group etc cetera, etc cetera, but i'm talking about adults and people who do not have uh, hydrocephalic changes, but have very ugly porencephalic cyst or a track that's very annoying. And, and uh, is it, should I release the pressure if I'm taking too much of time or, I don't know. I, I, I don't have any advice. I don't know what to do. Henry, do you have a comment? Yeah, I haven't only seen that you have a white track if they develop hydrocephalus. Then of course this track becomes very white. But in all other cases, in this colloid cyst where we use just a lot of, it's hard to see the tract. It's very minimal. If you look at the corpus callosum, you see a very, it's only a few millimeters, two or three, you see there is the approach. Even with the uh, Vigor tube, when you take the 70 millimeter, I think the, the tip is 12, 12. I think it's just 12. It's very small. And even if you take a little larger, but I showed you the, the girl, uh, the lady from Russia, it was not a big track remaining in the end. The only white tracks I have seen when the patient has a hydrocephalus because of bleeding or infection or something, then you see it very white. And what I do in the kids, what, what was saying that you have the subdural collections, I try to make pure sutures and then I put fibrin glue. Yes. The, even in a little bit, it goes into the cortical area. I make a, a block with fiber and glue, and then you can really prevent this uh, subdural collections. Yeah. Can I ask a question regarding what, what you just said? I, I wasn't going to come on to this, but um, since you mentioned it, I think it's a really important point. And to set the scene about the question is a, is a comment. With endoscopy, there's a limited amount you can do. You can push, pull, rotate, cut, bipolar, and that's about it. Whereas with microsurgical techniques, you've got a lot more flair with your sucker and bipolar, and, and you gentlemen know this much better than me. Um, the, 
the way technology is going, it's very promising that you can actually start to do all of that down an endoscope, particularly with a dry field, if you suck everything out and basically do it down a, an endoscope. So there's a lot to look forward to. Um, and so my question is, do you think that's round the corner with really good endoscope to allow you to do that? And, and regarding the tract, if I make just a quick comment, um, it sound, it's still baffling for me in this century, in this decade that we live, that we don't have a more elegant way to create a tract to put an endoscope. I've previously used, when I was doing larger volume in Birmingham, the, the trick with a, with, a, with a finger of a glove cut tied to a dandy cannula, put down the cannula with a cannula through it and inflate it with saline and you dilate a tract. And with the hope of if you dissecting with that balloon, you take that out and then you put your endoscope in thinking the tract will collapse. Um, and I even met with the head of R&D in B. Braun to invent a new cannula with the help of um, colleagues in the unit in old Queen Elizabeth Hospital. But because it's so difficult to get the CE markings, which I'm sure Henry will know a lot more about, to, that you put anything in touch with the brain, the spinal cord, no one was interested because it's cheap to produce. There's not a lot you can get off it and et cetera. But still in this day and age, we don't have a more elegant way of creating a tract. Um, uh, and the final comment is that once you've got hydrocephalus and a hole with a brain, that's, a, that's the pulsation, that's the pathway to getting a, um, you know, a subdural and that whole connection building up. But I just wonder if, if you think there is, um, and, I, and I'm sure the answer is yes, but how quickly are we going to get better technology to really expand this field to do a lot more endoscopically in the same way that you do microsurgically. Um, do, you, do you see this coming around the corner with the new endoscope and the technology? Basil, maybe do you want to make any comments about that, particularly when you use the large bore scopes? Yeah, I think as long as you're, because then it becomes very much like the Vicor retractor in a way. You're, you know, the Vicor is a bit of a hybrid. You've seen Professor Schroeder just put the uh, endoscope inside. The stores used to have something called the easy go, which you could use for the spine. I used it in the brain once or twice, and you can have the endoscope inside the actual tube uh, and 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 look inside. It wasn't that helpful, so I stopped using it. But I think you know that in itself, people you know use use microscopic instruments with. I think the next step would be using microscopic instruments inside the endoscope, and we're working on that. And I think the people I'm working with might well be approaching. Uh, Professor Schroeder and others and Professor Zordi and just asking for opinions and so on everywhere, just to say, you know, can we develop it further? So I think there is more. The question is whether robotics then in the future ends up being, and we were discussing that not very long ago, but I think not robotics in terms of positioning the endoscope, but more robotics like a da Vinci type robotics. And I think we're very far away from being able to, you know, produce anything that small with that kind of functionality inside. But who knows in due course, uh, uh, we may be able to. You're oh, mute, Mansour. You're mute, Mansour. Ahmad, Henry, do you want to make any comments about the, the exciting future before we finish off? This is really, really <laughs> exciting. You know, 30 years ago, <laughs> we, we said robotics. <laughs> we will have some better things. And we have still basically the same we have 30 years ago. Yeah. And you know, these robotics, what I see are just very expensive, bulky holding devices, holding arms for 1 million. Who can afford this? In US, you cannot because you make marketing and say, I have a robot, I make robotic surgery and then patients come. But is this doing any better? No, it's not. The accuracy is depending on the navigation accuracy. So it's the same if you make a frame-based stereotaxy you have yeah. the same accuracy then with a robot. So I don't think it's a much benefit. Yeah. And of course, our, our surgeons, they have this Da Vinci thing and they are looking and working and these freedoms, what you have, that is nice. If we could make it very small, then we can use it, but it's much too bulky. And if you make it very small, it's not accurate because these instruments bend, you know? Yeah. When you are so small, you, you lose the accuracy. And also we make four portals in the brain? No, then it's better you oh, no. yeah. just one port, like a Vigor, and you make mechanical yes. dissection. So I think for brain surgery, I don't see it. They I, made I one, 
called the virtue. I have seven Rosa. years and I will retire. So in this time, I will. I think they still need our hands. That is yeah. good news for us. So no robot will will replace us. I saw one that they made. I think called Virtuoso, which somewhere in the US they were using that, and it just comes. Uh, there's someone here at King's as well trying to develop similar kind of things, which are they've got tendons, essentially the instruments, but you go in with an endoscope and you hold it that way and the instruments come out. So there's a, a camera and the instruments come out and they can move around a little bit more. But I've got to say, even that, which looked like the closest thing we could use, I didn't think you'd be impressed. And certainly when I looked at it, I thought. I don't know if it's going to do what we what we can already do without having the robotics. If anything, it's going to make us even more dissociated from something we're trying to be a lot more hands on with. Um, but who knows if they invest enough and can make better, better robotics that way, but not the holders. I agree. I think a lot of it is marketing um, <laughs> and it works. Yeah, sure. The sure. marketing works. Yeah. <laughs> and I think sometimes <clears throat> these dissection when you have two forceps for example i like to have traction counter traction a lot yeah today we had an epidermal it was very sticky to all the perforators and then when you just have one one approach with an endoscope and you can just push and pull that is not good you have to grasp it and dissect it and then with both hands it is uh, it's much better and then of yeah. course you need a larger working channel when you have yeah. a channel endoscope you move always both instruments and then it's not so good. It doesn't matter whether you take an endoscope or a microscope for visualization. That is not, this, not the point. The point is that you have to grasp it and dissect it around. That is for me the least traumatous way to remove tumors which are very sticky to each other. Um, so still uh, manual, still hands are required. <laughs> <laughs> Ahmed, any closing comments um, uh, from yourself as well? It's, it's wonderful. Thank you very much for inviting us to this uh, very, very interesting uh, discussion and, and, and presentations. I mean, I enjoyed it myself. And uh, we hope we uh, are going to go on with our plan. Yes. Indeed, thank you very much to all of you. Um, it's been really wonderful. I'm learning so much every time and I can just see uh, you know, a European fellowship uh, happening between you. I know the, the centers, the, the amount of work that you do and your experience is really deserving and it's just a matter of time. So this would be wonderful. And we'll work on the fifth neuroendoscopy title. Huge yeah. thank you to all of you. It's been a pleasure and honor and um, uh, and thank you once again for joining us tonight. And um, we'll we'll release the date for the next webinar when when you when you like to do that and the, the title of the next talk. I think we have an idea already. Thank you very very much. Thank you Ahmad. Thank you Basil. Thank you Henry. Um, and um, yeah, God bless you and have a merry Christmas. A very merry Christmas. <laughs> yes. Thank you for everybody. Thank for all the participants to join us. And I also wish Merry Christmas and. Uh, healthy and happy new year bye bye thank you goodbye good night thank you guys take bye. care bye